Hello everyone, this is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you to a brand new video series that we are entitling The Search for Muhammad. And this title was intentionally chosen by uh, Dr. Jay Smith, whom I always had the honor of having here with us in studio, and he will be joining me shortly to go through this particular topic. Obviously, when we say The Search for Muhammad, it will give the impression that we are searching for a character that is unknown. And when we talk about Muhammad, traditionally speaking, again, I want to emphasize, traditionally speaking, it is perceived that he has existed for 1,400 years, that if you want to learn anything about him, you can always go to the Quran, or you can go to the Hadith, that is collection of his own sayings, and better yet, you can go to his biography. However, what you will discover along the way during this video series that Dr. J. Smith, and I would tend to agree with him, will highlight a lot of controversial dates, geographical locations, and even things related to the origin of this character. Of course, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but I would like to also remind uh, our viewers that the topic about the existence of Muhammad is not new at least from the perspective of what we are trying to do here, myself and Dr. J, because back in 2012, a gentleman by the name Robert Spencer published a book that was titled, Did Muhammad Exist? And you can see it right here. And I'm going to put it also in front of me, just in case uh, for uh, the focus. And this was the first edition. And I say the first edition because uh, Robert Spencer is in the process of publishing the second edition of this book in 2021. In fact, we uh, will be having Dr., uh, I should say, uh, Robert Spencer with us in one of the live streams uh, that are coming soon, which you can go back and watch, uh, titled also uh, The Search for Muhammad, where he will be engaged with us to discuss this book and discuss also the new discoveries uh, that Dr. J. Smith have been unpacking. With that in mind, and without a further ado, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Jay Smith here to the studio. Dr. Jay, thank you so much, as always, for being here with us. Always good to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And this is a topic that is controversial. I can understand why. Just the title itself, The Search for Muhammad. Hold on a minute. What do you mean, The Search for Muhammad? We already know who he is. We know all about him. We have his biography. Right. We have his sayings. Uh, we have also the traditions that support him, the tafsir and the tahrik. All this, this doesn't make sense. And you'll hear this come back. Mr. Smith, come on, Al Fadi, you already know who this guy is. We've all learned about it. We've had him in our history lessons. Please, what are you asking about? And that's why this book was so groundbreaking. When he came out in 2012 and he asked this question, did Muhammad exist? That caught everybody by surprise. Since when can, can you even ask that question? And, and is he just piggybacking on, did, did Jesus exist? Is that all he's doing? He's playing the Mickey on the Muslims? No, he wasn't. He was asking a very pertinent question. But this is eight years old. This is eight years old. Today now, we have an enormous amount of new evidence that is supporting what he was asking yeah. back in 2012. We came and a what, long way. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, what I want to do is let's go in and introduce what we are, why we're even bringing this up. And this is something that really shocked me when I started getting into this type of material 25 years ago in 1994, 1995. I was there in London. I was studying under Dr. Gerald Hotting uh, at the School of Oriental and African Studies. And the question came up in that class concerning everything we know about Muhammad, his life. Well, let's just look at his life. So let's go to the slides and let's bring the slides up and let's look at the timeline. You can see a timeline there. And let's put the, uh, we're going to talk about the emergence of Islam according to the Islamic traditions. The first thing we know is according to the traditions, this is, we're going to, the traditions would be the Sira, the, the Hadith, the Tafsir, the Tahrik, those four genre of traditions, they all say that Muhammad was born in 570. There's the date there. But what about when the Quran was actually revealed? We know that that wasn't revealed until 610, according to the traditions. I'm going to keep saying that, according right. to the traditions. And then we were told that he suddenly was woken up in the middle of the night in 621, and he was told to get on the back of a winged horse called the Burak, and he was flown up to Jerusalem. He was there living in Mecca. Uh, which where he learned about the 50 prayers, which he then whittled down to five prayers, bouncing back and forth between the, the seventh and the fifth heaven, comes back down to Jerusalem and heads on back down to uh, Mecca. So that's in 621. 
And then in 622, he moves from Mecca to Medina, known as the Hijra. Uh, we're then told that he came back to Mecca, conquered it in 630, and then suddenly he dies in 632. So that is Muhammad's life. That is the narrative we have been given. That's the only narrative we have ever been told about his life. Now, I'm leaving an awful lot out just for sake of time. That's just the bare bones. But then we're told that after he dies, uh, possibly by poisoning, uh, Abu Bakr then takes over. So he rules for two years, and then he dies peacefully. He is replaced by Umar, who really only uh, is able to be on the throne for, or as a caliph for 10 years. And then he is killed. So Uthman comes to power, and uh, he rules from 644 to 656. While he is ruling, then the Quran is finally written down. It was compiled in 652, 656, 52, that time period. That's the Quran that we have in our hands today, we're told. This is what we're told. This is what the traditions say. And so he is killed in 656, and then Ali comes to power, and he is the last of these, what they call the rightly guided caliphs, the four caliphs, the Rashidun Rashidun. period. There you go. So there it is. Look at the timeline there. That is the only narrative we've ever been given. Now, are you happy with that? Are you happy with those dates? Are you happy with what you've seen right there on the timeline? Well, I mean, this is what I grew up learning. This is what almost every Muslim who doesn't want to believe in anything outside of the tradition uh, would disagree with this because they accept these dates as if they are set in stone. Okay. Where do you think this story comes from? Where do you think all these dates come from? Where do you think all these events that we have just seen up there on that timeline, where do you think they were written down? Or where would you like them to have been written down? Or let me say when, not where right now, but when. When would you have liked them to be written down? I mean, now, looking back, you would have loved for these things to be written almost immediately or within the lifetime of Muhammad or like right after. Yeah, by an Where eyewitness. you have eyewitness accounts. Like we have with Jesus Christ. Exactly. We know that when Jesus, or when he was speaking, when he was talking, when he was moving around, uh, he took a, bu- a pile of disciples, 12 disciples with him, and two of them, John and Matthew, wrote down exactly what they remember seeing, and they wrote down what they remember hearing. That's right. And they wrote while they were still living. Obviously, others, how would you be able to write? So those were written within 40 to 60 years after Christ's death. Uh, th- and the other two... Uh, Mark and Luke got it from the eyewitnesses. So you have four testimonies of Jesus' life, four testimony of what he said and did by either the eyewitnesses or those who got it from the eyewitness, right? That's correct. No problem there. That's correct. So we would demand, I would assume the same thing of Islam, uh, certainly about the companions of the prophet, they should have written down what he said and did, right? Yes. Within their lifetime, not his, obviously, because he died in 632. That's Let correct. me show you what we now know. And I'm going to go back to the timeline. So let's go to the next slide, and let's look at this timeline here. Let's uh, put up Muhammad's uh, death, 632. So there it is. He dies in 632. By this time, everything he said and did should now start to be written down, just like that's what happened after Jesus died. You know, we have Paul writing within 15 years after Jesus died uh, with we have the letters. And he didn't even see Jesus. He didn't even know Jesus. We know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written within 40 years of Jesus. Well, so certainly by 70, they're all written down. John would have written by 90. So within 60 years of Christ's death, who died in 33 33 AD, we have now all four Gospels and all of the letters of Paul. We have the whole New Testament written down. And even Paul, I mean, I know you said he didn't see Jesus. Uh, What you're meaning, of course, he didn't live with him when he was on earth as one of his apostles. It was an encounter that took place after the resurrected uh, Jesus, of course, met him on the way to Damascus. Yeah, yeah. And even there, Muslims attack Paul for what reason? For what you just mentioned. It's like, <laughs> oh, he wasn't with him, right? You know? And yet they give themselves the right, sadly, to attack the character of Paul. They attack the teaching of Paul. And here we are dealing with an issue that is far worse than that. Well, we haven't proved that yet. Let's not yeah. prove that. So let's yeah. go back to the timeline. Right. There is where Muhammad died in 632. So you're saying that you would like someone to have written it down within... Certainly, really, let's say 40 to 60 years like we have with yeah, Jesus' that's fine. life. That's fine. I mean, at least you have some eyewitness account. Okay, let's see the first biography. The first biography of what Muhammad did is written by this guy here, Ibn Ishaq. Right. Look at his date, 765. 140 years already, or 30 Ooh, do, 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 do. years after Muhammad's death. That's a problem, isn't it? I mean, it's impossible that Ibn Ishaq lived for that long. No, he did not live for I mean, he, he, It's yeah. obviously he was not living as Muhammad was living. Right. He would not have known him. He would not have seen him. He would not have heard anything about him. Right. So you cannot say he's an eyewitness. Did he get it from the eyewitnesses? 
we have no idea. Now, now we need to go back to that. Let's go back to the slides and let's take a look at where the, the dates are for the, this is written down. And we start with Muhammad's death. He dies there in 632. Where do we hear about his material, about his life? We go to Ibn Ishaq. Look at the dates there, 765. So you're talking about roughly, uh, well, we're talking about 130 years later. Okay? Right. And in fact, here is the book right here. I've got it right here. This is the book that they always credited with Ibn Ishaq. So it says, The Life of Muhammad, a translation of Ibn Ishaq's Siratul Rasulullah, which means the biography of the Prophet that's Muhammad. That's right, Siratul Rasulullah, exactly. That's, that's a Sirah right there. That is a lie. Yeah. This is what everybody has been taught. This is what you have been taught. I have been taught that this was written by Ibn Ishaq. Look how thick it is. Right, and the reason why uh, people buy into it, because no one, sadly, either dares to publicly question it, or at least if they question it, they keep it to themselves, and they don't bring it up out front, basically. And this is the problem. We have this right. real, we're going to be talking about this later on. Right. So let's go back to the slide. So then who wrote this? Not Ibn Ishaq. This is the guy that wrote it, Ibn Hisham. Look at his dates, 833. You're talking about 70 years later. Right. 70 years later, Ibn Hisham takes what he likes of Ibn Ishaq, throw away what he does not like and of Ibn Ishaq. It. We don't know if he took only 2% or 5%. We don't know how much he took. He threw out, so we don't have anything of Ibn Ishaq. We only have what Ibn Hisham. So really, this book here is Ibn Hisham's book. This is right. not Ibn Ishaq. So, so let me say something here, an observation. What is it with these guys that take whatever they like and throw away or burn what they don't like? Because Uthman by now supposedly have done exactly the same thing. Uthman did it? Yeah. Take there, a look. We're going to get yeah. But before we get to that, I'm going to show you another example of that. We do know that there's one other person that writes a biography, and his name, uh, you know, I'm going to throw away Ibn Ishaq. Go back to the slide. I've thrown him away. He's now di di disappeared. Why? Because he just does not exist in this discussion. Right. He, he, we know nothing from Ibn Ishaq. We know from Ibn Hisham. Now let's go. There's another biographer, and this guy is al Waqidi. He dies about two years later. Yeah. His, interestingly, most people don't like to go to his. Why? Because it's all full of violence. Yes, it's called Kitab al Maghazi, the book of basically military campaigns. The military campaigns. Yes. That's why they don't like him. They yeah. would rather use Ibn Hisham because right. that's much more politically correct. Right. right. So that's the biography. Those are the two biographies that we're looking at. But there's another genre, and that's what we know as the, the sayings. The sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, that is the Hadith. The first to write them down in a, a, a categorized form to compile them is Al-Buhari. Look at his dates, 870. Right. Now, notice, here's another example. Just like we have with Ibn Isham, throwing away what he doesn't like and retaining what he likes. Al-Buhari has given 600,000 of these sayings of the Prophet. That's right. And he's told to whittle them down and eradicate that which he didn't like. He uh, From the 600,000, he whittles them down to 7,397. With some repetitions in him. Yeah, in fact, if you look at the old repetition, it's just down to around 2,000 yeah. unique ones. But from 600,000 down to 7,000, that's, that's basically he's thrown out 98%. And his reason was? Sus because they are inauthentic. Suspected fabrication. They're fabrication. Yeah. Who says they're fabrication? How does he know what's fabricated? Look at right. his dates again, 870. That's 240 years after the fact. And another thing, Jay, I mean, now let, I'm, I'm going to be uh, this critical guy who's going to sometimes challenge some of the things you're going to mention, sometimes point out things for the benefit of our viewers. We know Muhammad existed and died in 632 because of these sources. Be only because of these sources. That's right. So everything we know about Muhammad's life, his death, about him moving from Mecca to Medina, about his wives, all these things that we know about and concerning the background story that is not in the Quran, you have to get all this background story, all these nine volumes of Hadith that we have for al-Buhari alone, that 7,397 still make up nine volumes. What happened to the 98% he threw out? And where is it today? Wouldn't you like to look at it? I would like yeah. to look at it. Exactly. So okay. there has been a mass censorship that has gone on. But he's not the only one. Uh, let's go back. You can let's go back to the timeline. You also then have Sahih Muslim who died in 875. Then you have Al Tamiri who dies Al in 884. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then you have Ibn Majah who dies in 887. Yeah. Uh, followed by Al Dawud who dies in 899. Yeah. And then Al an -Nisai. I should let you read their names because my, my Arabic is desecrated. No, no problem. An -Nisai. So these are the Sunni 
uh, basically uh, canonized hadith, if you wish, sanctioned hadith. These collection. are the six canonized right. ones that That's are right. supposedly sahih, means perfect. That's right. Now, there, that, that's not the only genre. There is another, two other genres that come up, and there we'll put them in brown. The tafsir, which are the commentaries on the Quran, and then you have the tariq, which are the histories of mankind. That's so right. those are the four genres. Who is the first to write down the tafsir and tariq? Well, it's this character right here, Atabi. Oh, buddy, exactly. But look at his dates. I know. That's I mean, the 10th century. It's fascinating. In fact, Muslims point us out to Ibn Abbas, and they say, well, Ibn Abbas is the father of tafsir. He might be, but we don't have any of his writing. No, and we're dependent on people like Al-Tabari to report, re to us. report us. Exactly. Again, it's the same thing that Al-Buhari did. It's the same thing that Al Ibn Hisham did. They just reported what they wanted you to know. They just took what they considered to be the narrative that they uh, that they were interested in, and they threw out anything that disagreed with it. Yeah. So, we are, so basically what we're saying is everything, and let's look at the timeline here, Everything we now know about this man named Muhammad, about how Islam began, how about everything began, it is not beginning to be written down for 201 years. Here's another thing I wanted to mention just quickly uh, about the tafsir, for instance, uh, starting with Tabari. Uh, 300 years later, you get to another uh, gentleman, um, Al-Qurtubi, okay? And here is what you discover between Tabari and Qurtubi is that you are going to notice that Tabari starts giving opinions, not supported by, for instance, hadith or anything like that. You get to Qurtubi and they start picking up on, backing up their claims with hadith and with tafsir and things like that, with Quranic verses. Why? Those things have established by then. Now they have things to use as pretext for their opinions. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything is pointing to something that took place in this gap. Obviously, and we're going to get to that because go back yeah. to the timeline. I want to show you something else. When we get back to the timeline, let's just go and take that 200 years out and let's replace it with this guy here, Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik is the one that we have been saying for the longest period. You and I have mentioned this a number of years ago that this guy is the one that introduces the Shahada there on the coins and on the Dome of the Rock and also on the Caliph of Protocols. Look at his date, 692. So we're talking about 141 years after him that you start to get this narrative that he is introducing, right? But I want to go even one step further. I want to bring up Abbasids. The Abbasids come to power in 749. As we go through this series, I'm going to keep coming back to this point. It's the Abbasids that we need to have credit, give credit to because the Abbasids are the one that actually create this new narrative. And they have a problem with the Umayyads, including Abdul Malik. They have an enormous hatred for anything that came earlier. They hate the Umayyads. They want anything to do with the Umayyads. So really, if you're going to talk about this new narrative that is now being introduced by Ibn Hisham, Al-Wakiri, Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Tirmidhi, Majah, Dawud, Nasai, and also Tabari, you need to go back to when did this all begin. And you need to go back to the Abbasids. Now, let's look at the timeline again. Look at the Abbasids, 749. Under watch, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Ibn Ishaq is the one that first comes, he is the first one that introduces that narrative in 765. But Abbasids are 84 years ahead of this. Uh, they're uh, 84 years before it actually gets categorized. Let's go put up and let's make sure, let's uh, remind ourselves about our good friend Ibn Ishaq, who, did, who we haven't used before. His narrative is 60 a good 68 years before they finally get the one that they want really codified for the whole world to see. Mm -hmm. So can you see, this is, we're not talking about five or 10 years, we're not talking about 22 years, like Muslims like to believe that everything happened in a 22 year period from 610 to 632, no we're not. We're talking 200 years later, but not just 200 years, even by the time the Abbasids come to power in 749, that Ibn Ishaq, was the first one to write down that story of this man that they're, they're going to create as their prophet. We're going to tell you why they had to create him as a prophet. That's yet to come in other episodes. But even his is not good enough. Another 68 years, they finally come up with the, the canonized form of who this prophet is, and that's Ibn Hisham. Now can you see, it takes him another 40 years to even start talking, introducing his sayings. His sayings don't even come into appearance until 870. That's 240 years after Muhammad, right. uh, but it is a good century and, uh, and 30, 130 years after the Abbasids come to right. earth. So almost everything that we're going to be doing through these episodes has to do with the Abbasids. 
Remember that. We're introducing this at this time. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you one other thing. Let's look at the directions. Let's look and see where these guys came from. And maybe we can put that into another episode. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, what, what do you want to show? Uh, you want to go ahead to, and, and show us now? Uh, well, let's go ahead and do it. Yeah. I want to show you this here. Look at the slides again. Take a look at the problem of distance and direction. When you look at this, you will notice that the Islamic traditions say everything happened in Mecca and Medina, these two cities down That's here. That's right. All of the traditions, that includes the Sira, the Tafsir, the Tahrik, the Hadith, they all say it happened in those two cities that are circled in green. And the Osmanic, uh, basically, recension took place there, and the decimation of the Quran took place from there. I mean, that's, that's the That's what tradition. they're telling you. That's right. Look how far south they are, all right? Right. I'm going to say absolutely not. And this is where people need to start looking out a map and show where all these guys who are writing these things, where these guys came from. Let's start with our good friend. Uh, first of all, let's ask, first of all, where is it that they all are li residing? They're living in a place called Baghdad. Now, remember, I... Be careful. The name Baghdad comes into existence in the ninth century. Before it was the ninth century, it was called Stesiphon. I'm going to use the word Baghdad. I know some people will have will jump on me. Yasser Qadi jumped on me for calling it Baghdad at the time of Uthman. I, if I were to say Stefan, no one knew what I was talking about. You always use the modern day name. So Baghdad is the name. Let's take a look at Baghdad. There it is up there. Fascinating. It's 800, 1,800 kilometers north of Mecca. That's a huge distance. People aren't putting this on a map. What's more, we also know that Ibn Hisham, Ibn Hisham is the one that writes the, what we know is the, uh, the biography. He was actually born in Basra, but he did his work in Cairo. And actually, he, let me, let me back up on that. He was born in Basra, he grew up in Cairo, he actually did his work in Baghdad. So take a look at those three dots there. We do know that Cairo is a good 1,600 kilometers from Mecca, and we know that Basra is a good 1,800 kilometers from Mecca. Huge distances we're talking about here. Right. None of these guys so far have been down in Mecca Medina. They're much further north. What about us? Let's talk about Al-Buhari. He's the one that writes down the Hadith. He's from Bukhara. And where is Bukhara? Well, Bukhara is what is today Uzbekistan. In, in, in Persia, today is Uzbekistan. There it is beyond, on the map. You know, there you go. That today, back then, there was no Uzbekistan. That's just a, for modern people. Bukhara. That's why he's known as uh, Bukhari. From the name, his name is given. Now, how far is that from Mecca? Well, that's four thousand two hundred kilometers from Mecca. Right. Let's talk about Al Tabari, who is the one that introduces the Tafsir. He is from Tabaristan, which is in northern Iran today. Right. Northern Iran today. It wasn't called Iran back then. I have to keep on hedging my bets now because I know I'm going to get people say, you don't know what you're talking about. You're talking about the wrong name at the wrong date. Back uh, today, it is Iran, but back then it was called Tabaristan. And that's why he's al Tabari. He is from the place where he comes from. How far is that from Mecca? 2,800 kilometers. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? None of the traditional writers who talk about Muhammad, what he did and what he said, either lived or worked in Mecca and Medina, like the tradition suggests, they were much too far to the north of Mecca and came from west and east of Baghdad. So, all of these northern heirs are where the Abbasids originated. Let me just do one more slide, and let me just underline this point. The problem with this northern hegemony, the Islamic traditions say everything happened in Mecca and Medina. There's the Hejaz, that's the down south. Yet all of the writers of the traditions worked in Baghdad, which is 1,800 kilometers too far north. More than that, all of these northern areas are where the Abbasids originated from. Furthermore, all of the writers, look at the bottom now of the screen, all of the writers of the traditions worked in the 9th and 10th century. Therefore, our conclusion has to be they all wrote their material hundreds of miles too far away and hundreds of years too late. Can you see then why we're bringing this up? I knew about this back in 1994, 1995. Dr. Gerald Haunting was bringing this to my attention back there in class. And I said, well, why haven't we talked? Why aren't Muslims telling us this? When they talk about the companions were the ones that wrote this. No, the companions didn't write this. None of the companions who were there at the Muhammad's time wrote this down. Mm -hmm. These were all characters who lived hundreds of years later, 200 to two, 300 years later, and too far north, hundreds of kilometers away, thousands of kilometers away. Right. And that's why they, there is a science called the science of men, Ilm al-Rijal, to try to authenticate what these men, the narrators, have been saying. Why? Because you have a long gap, almost 200 years, and now you have to justify if this guy is reliable or not. Going backward, everything 
is pointing to going backward mm. rather than forward. Going backward than forward. Exactly. What I want to do in the next episode is talk about the Quran next. We've looked at the traditions. Right. We looked right. at the tafsir and the tahrik. We've looked at the hadith. We've looked at the sirah. Now we ask the same question. What about the Quran then? Right. Okay. That's going to be the next one. We will. Just for the record, folks, we're doing this in December of 2020. And I say this, Jay, because things can change <laughs> drastically. You're hedging your bets. You're, you're really protecting yourself because people can come back and say, you said this. And this is the difficulty with historical criticism. Right. Well, because of the fact that new things come to uh, fore, we're always scratching. Remember, we always say this, the more you scratch, the more you find. The more you find, the more we shine. The more we shine, the more they whine. Oh, how sublime. This is the problem. It's great because we love all the stuff that we're scratching and coming, bringing to the surface. But as we bring new things to the surface, we got to follow where the evidence leads. And yeah. the evidence is going to keep changing the narrative. As yeah, you can absolutely. see, between Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, the narratives change. Between right. Ibn Hisham and Al and uh, uh, Al Buhari, it changes again. And between Al Buhari and Al Tabari, it changes. It's going to keep changing for the Muslims. We therefore need to follow where the evidence is. That will change. So we may have to even increase or actually put some new evidence on the table in another year from now, in 2021. Absolutely. And the more they whine, we have cheese for that. And that's what we do. Here. Here for a living. Everyone, thank you so much. Hopefully you're enjoying uh, this introduction of the series. Imagine now how the whole series would look like. So uh, until uh, next time, hold on to your seats and hopefully you are going to share about this uh, with all of your friends uh, on social media. And also we encourage you to share these videos and repost them on different channels because we want this knowledge to spread everywhere. Until we meet again, have a blessed day.